Hello and welcome back to the Chumps at News Show. I'm Tom Cristiano. Well, I'm very excited because today uh, I'm cha taping with the chairperson of the select board here in Chumpsford, Virginia Crocker Timmons. And Virginia has been a select person for one year thus far, and she's running for re-election this year. Our election day is April 5th, so we're here about a month before the election to tape another show with another candidate. I taped Pat Wojcic a couple of weeks ago, and we have a third candidate, Erin Drew, uh, and she'll be on our show next week. So thank you for being here, Virginia. And thank you for having me. Uh, if we could begin with, uh, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about your background, anything that you'd like to introduce yourself to the people of Chelmsford, and why you're running for re-election this year after being on the board for three years. Mm -hmm. I guess you still like it somewhat. I do. Oh, good, <laughs> good. It. Thank you, good. Tom. Um, so I've loved living in Chelmsford for about 25 years now, wow. and I want to continue to ensure that Chelmsford is a community that people love to live and work in. Um, I'm running for the board mainly because I feel that there's still a lot left to do. Uh, when I first ran in 2019, some of the experience base and qualifications I said I brought to the table were uh, experience on a town committee on nonprofit boards. I had spent 10 years in middle management and 12 years in executive management. I had worked in <clears throat> startup environments, turnaround environments, and established organizations. And I think that it's not so much the experience base that we have, but how we apply it. And what I said back then was I want to apply that experience base in leadership for the people. And as I said, I think I've done that, and I feel like I'm just not done yet. Um, yeah. I can give some examples of where sure. there's more left to do. Yes, please. So uh, I was the lead board member in establishing the first vision and value statement for the town, oh. where we said that we want Chelmsford to be a welcoming and diverse community, yeah. uh, where we remain mindful of our historic past and where we are adaptable to the dynamics of the current environment. Yeah. And we also said that we want Chelmsford to be a community where residents enjoy excellence in education, access to open space, and a sustainable and vibrant quality of life. Nice. Well, that vision statement becomes a cornerstone around which departments and boards and committees can coalesce. Mm -hmm. It's also the foundation for our strategic planning, which we just initiated and oh. will take some time to complete. Um, beyond that, day to day and week to week, I've, I invest probably at least 10 to 20 hours a week um, doing my homework and due diligence on matters that are coming in front of the board. And I've really pushed to make sure that at the board table we're having open discussions and we're valuing different perspectives before we make those decisions. Oh. So um, like when we did our goal planning, yeah. we did it through a process where everyone had a voice and we all weighed in on what we thought our accountabilities and priorities would be. Um, I have jumped in with both feet in some of the traffic and truck issues in town, and we're in the midst of trying to address some long-term truck issues that we've had in Chelmsford, North Chelmsford, that are escalating due to some of the businesses up there. Um, I've been the first board member to try to get a coordinated approach going with our federal and state legislators to help with that. On the other side of town, um, I and other board members really did our homework when the asphalt plant there wanted to increase their storage capacity. And we pushed back on that uh, because of the impact we thought it was going to have to some of our residents. Yes, yeah. We have uh, disabled parking street side for the first time now in Center Village. Um, I am honored to be in the midst of uh, the select board representative for the fire station study committee, where we're looking at our different fire stations, um, not only the conditions of the buildings, but safety factors that need to be considered for our fighter fighters in the community in terms of our path forward. And we've really started to dig in and look at some of our infrastructure needs in terms of the sewer yes. capacity and our aging sewer infrastructure and the roadways and sidewalks. So um, yes. if reelected, 
where I want to continue my focus in leadership for the people is on the quality of lives of our residents. I don't think we can ever take our thumb off that. Yes. Um, in some of those critical infrastructure things that we're addressing with the sewer and the roadways. Yes. And I think we need to continue to push ourselves to do proactive planning and make sure that mm -hmm. we're executing against those plans in a culture of cooperation and trust. Yes. Wonderful. So, so many, so many uh, issues and topics we have in the town that you're working on. Yeah. We're just 10 to 20 hours a week, you say, to prepare for each meeting? Um, it's not just to the preparation for the meeting, but there are other things that come up in town that, you know, we address or if, if there's issues that come up. Um, and then we're, all, we're also assigned as liaisons, so we keep up with what's going on with other boards and committees. Um, yes. My assignment in the fire station committee, that will demand more of my time on some weeks than others. Yes. So it just really depends what's happening. Yes. But I would say bare minimum, most of the, I think most of the members, you know, if you're going to do it and do it right, you put yes. in a, a, about 10 hours. <laughs> yes, wow. It's so much. Well, you, there's a couple of things that you mentioned I'd like to follow up on. Sure. Uh, the fire stations, I haven't been up by the... North Fire Station lately, but is it completed yet? I knew we're doing a big remodeling of the North Fire Station, which is right across the street from our North Town Hall. Yeah. How is that coming along? It's it's, it's completed. Yeah. Um, and how and does it they, look? they actually had a, oh, it, I think it looks fantastic. Um, yeah, I think it's a really nice, it's, moder it's modernized for the firefighters and their needs. Um, yeah. They had a ribbon cutting for it uh, before the snow started flying, so that was yeah. really nice. We had a lot of members in the community and firefighters come out to celebrate the opening. Nice, so, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to get over there sometime. I didn't I'm make sure it to the love opening, to give but you a tour. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm good friends with a lot of firefighters. They yeah. they do a great job. Gary Ryan is a chief, right? Yes, he's a very nice guy. I see him biking on the bike path occasionally, not mm -hmm. too often, but it's always great to see him yeah. there riding. Another thing that you mentioned was the sewer capacity. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I heard was that we basically can't have new development right now because we don't have the sewer capacity for new development. Is that correct? That is, you know, we used to have it with Lowell or something, and then it's, it's no longer there, and we need to develop some new sewer capacity yeah. or authorization to use more in Lowell before we could build more, is that correct? Yeah, so there's a couple things with the sewer. One is capacity, and then one is just that it's an aging infrastructure. So we've had pump station failures and things like that that we've had to address. But with respect to the capacity, we have, um, we're in our second year of a sewer moratorium. And so if there is, I, legally I don't think we can preclude development if it's le legal and legitimate, but if there is any new development, um, they would have to either provide their own sewage treatment plant like Such the as the UMass tank? West. Um, oh. Well, this is a sewage treatment, like like the UMass West development that's going yeah. to go in. They're actually going to put an on-site sewage treatment plant there. Wow. Um, single home that goes in, they may have to put in a septic tank versus a connection to the sewer. And that might be temporary in a way until until they could connect to the I, sewer, I, or, or I, we don't know. Well, I don't because know it's that costly, we can mandate but... to put those connections in for capacity that doesn't exist yet. No, I meant once it's... Uh, yeah, once, I, I'm not sure oh, we don't I'm know, sure yeah. we know yet. Um, they probably would have to pay over $25,000 for a septic tank, right? Uh, I imagine. I, I don't know I don't the cost know. off the top be, of my head, Tom. I bet you'd be expensive. But, but you know, Lori Trahan and others are also working. You're right. The, the, the issue we have is that we can't get the capacity from Lowell. Yeah. And we're not alone. There's other municipalities that are having the same challenges. Yeah. Um, and it's something that really has to be solved uh, bigger than just each individual municipality, which is why some of our legislators are getting involved in it now. Yes, yeah, Lori's working really hard on a number of issues, yeah. as she always does, our congressperson in Washington. <laughs> Um, well, you mentioned the development at the uh, former UMass Lowell West Campus in mm -hmm. North Chelmsford on Princeton Street, and there was a special town meeting just this past week where two Warren articles came up. Could you tell us how those Warren articles came and how they were voted upon and, and your thoughts about this big development? And I say big because it's like over 400 units or something it's about, of housing? It's about 400. About 400. Um so the two articles that you're referring to, one was uh, to rezone, to provide a zoning overlay um, for that area, yeah. which would allow the development of 
uh, multifamily housing, including some affordable housing and 54 units of senior housing, um, which we desperately need in town. And the other article was to um, appropriate community preservation funds to support the senior housing development yes. with um, David Hedison and yes. his group. And so both articles passed, uh, really, I think, by an overwhelming majority. The, the first one was at least by 80%. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah. And yeah. the senior and so housing was, must have been really and, overwhelming too, right? The, that vote for the senior? Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, was, I mean, that was equally supported. The, yeah, um, nice. So, you know, and I, I think the majority of the town meeting representatives felt that it was the right development for that area. Um, yes. From my perspective, it's the most cooperative engagement that I have ever seen from a developer coming into town in terms of working with the neighbors, working with the town, working with the relevant boards and committees. Good, good. Um, it must be a big developer, right, to build such a big development. I mean, this per yeah, this company this is, is very experienced, right? Yes. And because they have to put up and get loans for millions and millions of dollars, yeah. I imagine. So yeah. oh, what's but the name of the company? Do you know? It's the company is Trammell Crow Residential. Oh, Trammell Crow, yeah. And they're going to be providing funding to the town for um, intersection traffic improvements. They're going to be providing funding for l understanding what needs to be done in terms of impacts for our school systems. They're providing, um, they have work conservation restrictions with the Conservation Commission for about 25% of the land, I think, is is uh, conservation land. Oh, good, good. Yeah, and so there's a there's a lot of good things I think that are going to come from it for the community. Is there going to be a playground? Any any outdoor exercise equipment in that facility? I I hope so. They were they were planning um, an area for the residents, and then they're also talking about potentially putting in a pocket park or something like yeah. that, so that um, even people walking in the surrounding communities could walk up and enjoy the, you know, the open space that's that's there and the and like the that. playground whatever mm -hmm. they have there that's wonderful yeah. that'll be great for the yeah. town and uh, so now that it hit the two Warren articles have passed what's the next step on that development that is you know when could they start actually building it and um, is that going to be a year away or something? It's, or? it's probably at least a year away, and it's going to be phased. Oh. Um, but oh, yeah. the first thing that has to happen, which usually takes, I think, about six months, is our articles and the votes on those have to be approved by the, um, the state, right? Yes. Yeah. So once we get that approval, then they can start moving out with the planning board on any permitting and things like that that Good. need to happen. Wonderful. So, well, I think yeah. this will be great for the town. Yeah especially all the senior housing for us senior citizens. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm all set in my house. I've been there almost 45 years, as you may know, yeah. and I love it there. So, well, that's great. And, well, another big issue that's coming up every year in Chelmsford is tax classification. Mm -hmm. And, for, well, for many years we had where the businesses would pay more. And then about 20 years ago we changed it so it would be flat for residential and business would pay at the same rate, same tax rate. And then, what was it, about three years ago or something, and uh, maybe four, the select board, and they vote like every December on this tax classification, they decided to vote to increase the tax rate on mm -hmm. businesses because they wanted to give homeowners a break on their taxes and try to lower it, so they raise it on businesses. So right now, that's where we're at. We're still the businesses are still charged more than residential. So what are your thoughts about that? Since you'll be voting on it, right? Every mm -hmm. December, you vote. Mm -hmm. usually have a committee. They come in with a report in November, and then yeah. you vote in December or something. And But it's a big, important issue. Right. The, the businesses in Chumps are so, very... So the rate, the rate is the rate, and the classification is the split of who bears, you know, yeah. what percentage of that rate. So um, when I came to the board, it had just been split from 1 to 1 to 1.27. So that was three um, and years I, that, ago. I think that was a, and it was done by the, the board press. So it's been that, the split's been in place for about four years now. Um, we've been able to bring that, we can't do kind of a whiplash back and forth, right? But what we did do was we brought that rate down to, the split down to 1.2 is where it is now. Yeah. So it's come down um, a, a, a couple points. Um, I think 
there's a balance that people are trying to make between our fixed income residents who are really hurting as taxes go up and the small businesses who really do a lot for the community. And I think that it's the small businesses who are impacted most, um, which is another reason why I think that 10% small business exemption is really important to preserve. Um, we're not seeing from the larger businesses that they're leaving the community or that it's an obstacle yeah. to coming into the community in terms of the tax split. Yeah. We're the lowest tax split of the surrounding municipalities that have one. And I think what's really important going forward, and I brought this up in November, yeah. is what our businesses and our residents need right now are stability and predictability in what we're doing with the taxes, right? So we get into our November meetings and there's emotional arguments and rational arguments on both sides. And um, what communities who have a split do say, okay, well, I have a certain residential factor and as property values change, that changes the burden that residents, the residents and the businesses have. And so with those dynamics year to year, I'm going to look at maintaining that residential factor and adjust the split accordingly to, to maintain the factor. That's one approach. Yeah. But what I had suggested to the board is we need to put something out there that says this is our approach to tax classification or not having tax classification and this is what we're going to do. And I think we have to have that discussion in the spring or the summer. Um, I think we're at a point right now where the businesses have adjusted. I'm not in favor of increasing it. Um, increasing it on businesses. Increasing the, the split. Rent. No, I'm yeah, not in yeah. favor of doing that. Yeah. But what we have to do is um, say what really is our plan and what's yeah. our approach and yeah. not wait until we're in the heat of the moment every November yes. to just decide. Yes. Right. And I, I think that that forethought will do both the residents and the businesses a lot of good in terms of just getting some stability around this whole issue. Yes. Do you hear from the residents or businesses about this at all during the year or no? Just in November, December? When the tax bills come, that's when oh, we yeah. hear. Yeah. You know, and especially, I mean, this year, residential home values escalated at a yeah. rate that was higher than commercial property right. values. That's why. Right. So, right. Uh, honestly, the, although the split's in place, a lot of residents felt probably maybe more pain than some of the businesses because of yeah. those value escalations. Yes, my taxes went up quite a bit uh, yeah. this past year. <laughs> Mine did too. <laughs> and I, but I guess the home value went up, which is great, if yeah. I ever wanted to sell. Right. But, uh, yeah. So what can you do? I, but a lot of people are concerned about their real estate taxes. I yeah. Personally, I don't have a problem paying it, so it doesn't bother me at yeah. all. But I am concerned about those who are on a tight budget, you know. Right. But, well, um, you've been on the board for just about three years now, right? It's yeah, coming I up have. in April. I and have, yeah. So what have you liked most about your first three years on the board of the select board? Um. I guess, to, to put it succinctly, I have liked when I can see the positive impact we're having for the community. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we like had... Like with the we new had, fire station? With what? The new fire station? Sure. We, we, had, we had traffic listening sessions. The, uh, the They started the first year I was on the board, and we had another one last year. Well, some really good things have come out of those, like the, um, the redesign of the traffic at Academy and and North Road, you know, to improve safety. And there's there's other just, you can start to see some real tangible changes in the community for the better. And, yes, yeah. Uh, that's what I like most so you love is when that. you can that's see that. That's wonderful. So, and but the bottom line is you like the job of being a select person. I do. <laughs> and being a, the chair this past year, the chair person, did you like that at all? Or was it too much pressure? <laughs> Um, no, I don't think it's any more pressure than being a board member. I mean, we have to own and be accountable for our decisions and our actions, regardless of what position we have on the board. Yes. So um, for me, it was just the the added piece of making sure that I'm prepared to run the meeting. Yes. You know, and um, and you have and no running pro the meeting. <laughs> you have no problem doing that. No. Have you no. had experience in business running meetings or committees? Yeah. Oh, good, yeah. good. And I, I do a lot of professional facilitation and things like that for my current career. So. Well, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so, can I also ask you what you've liked least about being on the select board during your three years? Is there anything, there must be something you didn't like, or a few things, mm -hmm. I, that you, anything you could mention? <laughs> sure. Um, 
I think one of the things that's been hardest for me is when um, people, whether they're residents in the community or employees or even reporters, um, push about executive session meetings yeah. or dance on the edge of it yeah. or speculate without having any facts. Yeah. And it, it pains me a lot because yeah. I want to be more transparent, but legally and ethically, we, yeah. you know, we simply can't. We had, just to put it in perspective, we had 39 regular session meetings in 2021 and 22 executive sessions. Wow. And we're, you know, we're talking about complex issues for the town in those yeah. executive sessions. And for us to even talk a little bit about it, not only is ethical and illegal, but oh. it puts the town and the taxpayers at risk for, you know, liabilities yeah. and lawsuits and things. Yeah. And so for me, that and sometimes the lack of civility yeah. around it has um it's been difficult yeah that's and, too bad and i there are a lot of times when i wish that we could just um honor the process <laughs> and honor the obligation that we have as board members yes um, and not speculate and and not yeah. push to try to get information that isn't um accessible Pu yes because it's executive session reasons. and uh, and it's not supposed right. to be discussed outside right. of the executive session. Yet the reporters sometimes it, ask you about it, or a residents, what's point, going on yeah, with this person right. or that person. And and, and it's been it's been hard for me too because I'm you know, transparency is one of the things that's really important to me. But that's just simply yeah. an area where where we can't. Yes. So that's that's. Could I ask you um, about how many phone calls do you get from residents? Uh, before each meeting or on average you get any phone calls or do you get a preponderance of emails you get many emails so i'm wondering I, how much the residents I, try I think it depends on on what the topics are for a given oh, meeting yeah. um on average i would say maybe zero to two yeah uh, uh, but, phone calls or emails or yeah both. yeah but but then there are weeks where you know it could be like 10 or 20 depending what the topic is yes you know yes. so it just it fluctuates I see. Um, yes and one of the things you know i've encouraged people if they want to say something come to public input yes um we have a topic on the upcoming agenda for monday that paul cohen and i thought would be of interest to the public in terms of the roadway infrastructure um, and what some of the pavement plans are. And yeah. so we actually built public input right into the agenda for that right. one. So Good. hopefully that will help alleviate some of the yes. um, the need for people to feel they have to reach out ahead of the meeting. But, I mean, we're, we're there, we're accessible, that's what we're supposed to do. So Wonderful. And all the other select board members feel the same way? They, they don't mind getting emails, phone calls, or you don't know, maybe? I, I can't speak for the other board yeah. members, but I what I've observed is um, they at least feel it's important to acknowledge. Yeah. You know, we, we may not be able to get into de decisions and opinions with every phone call, because that should be done at the board table. Yes. But I know I always try to at least acknowledge. 